The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This is your captain speaking. We are beginning our descent into madness. <laughs> And we are back to another edition of West of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for sticking around. I know it's late for some of you, but we're going to make it with you a while. We have a really, really exciting show lined up for you guys tonight. Genevieve, how are you doing over there? I'm doing quite all right. You're doing good? Not too bad. You excited looking, for this one? Definitely looking forward to this. Tonight, as people may know, and uh quick shout out to... uh the people listening to us on iHeartRadio, Ustream. And uh, if you're catching the podcast on iTunes or on our website. Future shout out to you. <laughs> hello to you from the past. As I was saying, as many people may know by now, our guest tonight, and we're really excited to have him, is none other than uh, Dr. Rick Strassman, author of the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And Genevieve, I know you have a, an introduction ready for our guest. Dr. Strassman was born in 1952 in Los Angeles, good old California. And he's a medical doctor specializing mm -hmm. in psychiatry with a fellowship in psychopharmacology research. Dr. Strasman was the first person to perform new human studies with psychedelic drugs in the U.S. following the 20-year ban, during which only animal studies were legally permitted. His research involved the powerful, naturally occurring compound DMT, also known as N-N-dimethyltryptamine. It can be found in a myriad of plants and animals, as many of you know, including humans. Commencing in 1990, he administered several hundred doses of DMT to approximately 60 volunteers over the course of about five years. Now his world-renowned book, DMT the Spirit Molecule, documents this research. It has sold over 100,000 copies to date and has been translated into 12 languages. It's also inspired an independent documentary by the same name, which I know a lot of you have watched. It was picked up by Warner Brothers and released full 2011. With three distinguished collaborators, he then went on to co-author Inner Paths to Outer Space, which looks more carefully at the common other worlds experience that volunteers frequently reported during his research. In 84, he received lay ordination in a Western Buddhist order and co-founded and for several years administered a lay Buddhist meditation group associated with the same order. Dr. Strassman underwent a four-year personal psychoanalysis in New Mexico between 86 and 90. He has published nearly 30 peer-reviewed scientific papers, has served as a reviewer for several psychiatric research journals. He's been a consultant to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, National Institute on Drug Abuse, Veterans Administration Hospitals, Social Security Administration, and other state and local agencies. Now, if that isn't enough, he's currently Clinical Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He's also President and Co-Founder of the Cottonwood Research Foundation, which dedicates its research to consciousness. Now, just as a quick side note, you can purchase his books directly from the website and you can get them signed. And I know for a fact that um, he does his best to answer his email, so you can contact him via his website. I've heard people describe their experiences, you know, while using DMT as this ego-crushing experience. Let me tell you, uh, Rick Strassman's list of achievements is pretty ego-crushing. <laughs> don't, don't need DMT now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But let, let's bring on uh, Dr. Rick Strassman. Uh, Dr. Strassman, can you hear us okay? I can. Frank, thanks for having me on, and thanks for that introduction, Genevieve. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Let me start from the beginning. How did you first come to find out about this compound DMT, and, and what was it that that interested you about it? Well, I found out about DMT during my first independent research uh, study, which was looking at the human biology of the pineal hormone melatonin. This was in the mid-1980s or so. And I was looking at melatonin because it's produced by the pineal gland, and I had a intuition that the pineal was involved in naturally occurring spiritual experiences that weren't related to drugs. Um, you know, there was some evidence at the time, mm -hmm. and this was before much was known about melatonin. There was some evidence at uh, the time that melatonin was quite, uh, you know, psychoactive, you know, maybe even psychedelic. So my study progressed with melatonin. There wasn't especially pronounced effects of the compound on subjective experience. And, uh, 
in the meantime, I had learned about DMT, mm-hmm. which is also a naturally occurring compound and is quite psychedelic. The pineal gland, it's a bit of a, of a mystery, it seems. What did your research find to uh, support the idea that DMT is produced in this small gland in our brain? Well, I had first you know, heard about the pineal gland as an undergraduate uh, at Stanford. I had written some class papers on a spiritual or, uh, you know, kind of uh, speculating about the biology or the, the, the biological bases of spiritual experience. And I was referred to a professor at Stanford at the time named Jim Fadiman. Mm-hmm. And this was in the early 1970s. He told me that I should look into the pineal gland, which I had never heard of at the time. Mm-hmm. It was still a pretty obscure organ. So there wasn't much known about you know melatonin you know back in those days. So mm-hmm. I was free to speculate um, to a pretty you know wild extent in you know some ways. Um, but uh, you know as a result of my interest in the pineal, um, and you know the pineal gland is interesting because it's um, been you know considered to be a spiritual organ by a number of esoteric you know physiologies mm-hmm. over the millennia you know the hindu chakra system mm-hmm. the you know sephirot of the kabbalah you know they all seem to place the location of spiritual experience of the white light of enlightenment or the ultimate uh encounter with God in a location which corresponds to the anatomical pineal gland in the middle of the skull. Mm-hmm. It you know, seemed as if uh, it's being an unpaired organ in the brain, one of the only unpaired organs in the brain, uh, also drew the attention of Descartes, who mm-hmm. believed it was a spiritual gland in as much as it might potentially you know, mediate the movement of the soul with human consciousness mm-hmm. um, you know because you know people are only able to think of one you know thought at a time mm-hmm. he believed you know that the pineal gland uh, you know with respect to its you know being an unpaired organ could be the you know biological conduit or biological you know valve uh, which allowed us to think Mm-hmm. Uh, if, according to the metaphysics of you know, that time, you know, believe that you know, people thought through divine inspiration, you know, coming uh, you know down from God, as it were, right? You know, so uh, you know the metaphysical speculations aside, uh, um, it's you know seemed as if you know melatonin could be psychedelic, mm-hmm. and then when that didn't you know turn out to be the case. Um, I began, you know, looking, you know, at the responses to DMT given to normal volunteers. Uh, you know, I uh, speculated uh, quite a bit in my first DMT book about a pineal origin of DMT. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that was only uh, established as objective, you know, data just, you know, a couple, three years ago. You know, but up until then, it had been known for close to 60 years that the lungs make DMT. Oh, wow. You know, so the pineal gland, you know, theory was kind of frosting on the cake in a number of ways. But, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, people seem to live normal lives without a pineal gland. And if you're looking at, you know, the physiology of, you know, MT, mm-hmm. um, it you know seems to be taken care of you know pretty well through the constant production through the lungs. And I want to come back to the pineal gland a little later, but let's talk about DMT. I know that DMT, as it's used in the ayahuasca ritual, the, the ayahuasca ceremonies, uh, it seems to be pretty common in the Americas. You know, specifically uh, Latin America. Um, in your research, uh, where else did you find that DMT was being used? Well, it was first you know discovered in Latin American, uh, you know, psychedelic plants, uh, including ayahuasca and a number of snuffs, you know, psychedelic snuffs, Mm -hmm. um, which you, you know, would inhale, you know, through your nose. Um, And it was, you know, discovered to be psychedelic in Hungary in the Mm mid-1950s. Then it was discovered in lower animals like rabbits and rats, and then was discovered in the body of flu of humans a few years after that. Wow. Um, it, it was smoked on the street, you know, recreationally in the 1960s, but it, you know, never really got much traction as compared to LSD or mescaline or psilocybin. 
Um, and it still isn't as you know popular as you know those drugs, mm-hmm. especially psilocybin and LSD. You know, but Terrence, you know, McKenna, mm-hmm. you know, began to speak about DMT in the 1980s, and uh, I think as a result of his, uh, you know, speaking about the drug and its you know properties, and then you know my research, it's become more popular uh, in the pure uh, you know form, just uh, smoking the free base of DMT. But I think it's as popular in the Amazonian brew ayahuasca, as mm-hmm. you were mentioning, as it you know, probably is smoked in pure you know, form. In the uh, documentary uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, it is mentioned that it's also a mystery how these uh, groups of indigenous people managed to find and, and separate you know, DMT and turn it into ayahuasca. What are some of the theories as to how this could have happened without modern science or chemistry? Yeah, it's you know kind of a miracle in 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 you know some ways. Um, yeah, if you just swallow DMT by itself, either the pure drug or the drug found in a plant, um, it's broken down immediately in the gut, mm-hmm. and the enzyme which breaks it you know down is called monoamine oxidase or MAO. Mm-hmm. And um, if you combine DMT with an inhibitor of the enzyme that breaks it down. Uh, then it'll, it's, it, uh, stays in the gut for a long enough time to be absorbed into the bloodstream and from there to the brain. Mm-hmm. You know, so the chances, you know, Jeremy Narby is a Swiss anthropologist who's done a lot of research with ayahuasca. And, um, you know, he, you know, calculated the odds of just, you know, randomly combining, you know, uh, you know, two plants, mm-hmm. uh, one that contains DMT and one that contains the inhibitor of the enzyme that breaks it down, uh, in order to make an orally active, you know, DMT preparation. And, uh, he came up with some number like, you know, one in 10 trillion or something like that as, you know, just the random possibility. Right of, you know, combining the, you know, two plants by chance. You know, if you speak to the natives, you know, they tell you that the plants told them uh, that, um, I think, you know, more specifically, well, the plant which contains the MEO inhibitor is called Banisteriopsis capi. And, you know, that, you know, seems to be, you know, kind of like the smart plant out there. Um, If you take, you know, that plant, and you combine it with other plants, mm-hmm. you know, then, you know, the other plants, you know, properties become a lot clearer, you know. So I think if you scratch below the surface, it may turn out to be the case that these people were on the Banisteriopsis and were looking around the forest for the most appropriate, you know, plant mm-hmm. to combine with it in order to produce visions. And uh, they, you know, for whatever reason or in, you know, whatever manner, uh, you know, we're able to locate, you know, the DMT containing plant. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about this for a while. I know Frank and I have had a lot of discussions about this, but one of my first thoughts has always been that what people on DMT seem to reach or achieve is something either analogous or almost the same to what people achieve when they're meditating. And I'm talking, you know, Buddhist style meditations of reaching a nirvana sort of state so kind of linking to that question could it in some way be seen as maybe not right or kind of cheating to reach a meditative nirvana without actually going the path you know towards it uh, without you know it's, it's kind of like a shortcut and what are the metaphysical implications of that well, you know, if you think about these plants as tools or mm-hmm. these drugs as tools, you know, it's kind of like, are you going to fly to New York or are you going to walk? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, you could fly to New York and it's, you know, quicker. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you walked, you would be going through a lot of experiences. You would have talked to a lot of people. It would have mm-hmm. been a lot harder. Um, and you probably would have enjoyed your experience in, you know, New York a lot, mm-hmm. you know, more than if you just, you know, hopped on a commuter plane, you know, something that you do once a month or, you know, something like that. But at, you know, the same time, if you do your homework before going to New York, you can get a lot out of it. Mm-hmm. Perhaps the, you know, same amount that you would if you had walked there. So I, I think when it comes to 
what you know some people have called the gratuitous you know grace of the psychedelics or the you know shortcut to nirvana or mm-hmm. you know similar expressions i i think you know there is you know some truth behind that idea you know that if it is too easy you don't appreciate it mm-hmm. or if it's instant and all you have to do is smoke a substance or swallow a pill you know that you're not going to feel like you've deserved it or you've worked up to it you've you know done all the you know preliminary steps you know um, a lot of the preliminary you know kind of work uh, that is involved with a prayer practice or a meditation practice um, includes you know intellectual training and ethical training yeah. you know to understand what you're about to embark on you know the best you know, ways of interacting with people on the spiritual um, worlds in order to, um, you know, get the most out of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the kind of, you know, foundational practices which are, you know, developed and, you know, practiced before you attain these higher states. Mm -hmm. And once you attain the higher states, you're able to place them in some context, Mm -hmm. both interpersonally, emotionally, psychologically spiritually and i think if you're not prepared if you have no mm-hmm. you know foundation yeah. uh you don't really know what you're seeing you can't really extract much useful information from it mm-hmm. uh, you may even end up being more confused than you were when you you know, the, yeah. you know than before you you know had that experience mm-hmm. you know so i think if you compare the experiences themselves you know they're ex- extremely similar you know, for example, in my new book on the prophetic state, mm-hmm. uh, I compare descriptions of the prophetic experience in the Hebrew Bible with descriptions of the volunteers, you know, DMT experiences. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the content of the states are quite, you know, they're, they're extremely similar. But, yeah. you know, clearly the impact of the prophetic state as recorded in the Bible is a lot more pervasive and enduring than the reports of my DMT volunteers. So I think it um, is a lot, you know, more than the pure experience all by itself. Yeah. It, you know, it you know needs to be placed in some context and communicated uh, in as beautiful and you know resonant a kind of language as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those kinds of issues are quite important. In your book, DMT: The Spirit Molecule, you um, talk about Aldous Huxley who tried LSD in the 50s under the supervision of, of a psychiatrist. He supported a theory that psychedelics, you know, should only be accessible to a, a select few people because the average person would not be capable, I guess, of reaping the benefits, if you will, of psychedelics. So I guess I got a two-part question. Number one, are psychedelics in general something that can be used uh, recreationally? And number two, would you advise somebody to have a a guide or as we see in latin america and some other cultures a shaman that seems to guide them through their experience well yeah i I mean those are very important questions you know uh, from a historical point of view you know there were two camps which emerged in the 60s you know one was the kind of elitist camp Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, represented by Huxley. And uh, the other was the more kind of blue-collar, everybody, egalitarian kind of approach. Like everybody ought to be able to, you know, to take these drugs Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they're inherently good and you'll have a good experience no matter what. You know, that was kind of the, you know, Tim Leary and Ken Kesey approach. You know, so I think there's pros and cons to, you know, both of those. Uh, with respect to the elitist approach, uh, you would, you know, probably have fewer adverse effects if fewer people took them and mm-hmm. it was a more sophisticated sample of, you know, people that were using these drugs. And, you know, I guess perhaps, you know, more philosophy, you know, science and whatnot could emerge from people taking those, you know, drugs than, you know, just your average, you know, Joe Blow. But on the other hand, um, you know, there were a lot of people who took these, you know, drugs without much, you know, preparation or supervision or understanding of what, you know, they were getting into. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had a, you know, full blown mystical or spiritual experience. And, you know, then, the, you know, they went on to understand it, uh, to integrate it, 
to do research, for example, to enter religious training, to become an artist or a scientist. You know, so I think if it weren't for, uh, you know, Tim Leary and, you know, Ken Kesey and the more egalitarian approach, you know, not as many people would have you know been exposed to these drugs and all of the good wouldn't have, you know, come out of, you know, that kind of more, you know, free for all use. But at, you know, the same time, you know, there were a lot of casualties, you know, a lot of, you know, psychiatric casualties, you know, health problems from overdoing it with these drugs and a unsupervised, you know, kind of, you know, condition. You know, there were a lot of, you know, psychotic breaks, a lot of suicide, you know, a lot of, you know, mental damage as a result of completely unsupervised use, you know, combination with with other drugs and alcohol, you know, not being very, you know, stable psychiatrically in the first place you know, those kinds of, you know, setups, you know, for adverse effects. So it's been a, you know, mixed bag Mm -hmm. and, you know, evolution, you know, marches on. So I think we're still, you know, figuring out the best, you know, set and setting in which, you know, to take these drugs. There are, you know, shamanic models, you know, the ayahuasca culture has, you know, come out of a shamanic model, which is one in which, you know, somebody who's especially trained with these plants or drugs, you know, receives a calling and then undergoes a, you know, rigorous apprenticeship and, you know, training and background, uh, you know, work with these and other plants. You know, I think a lot of people are describing themselves as shamans without very good credentials behind them. So right. I think if you have a good, you know, shaman, you can, you know, get some, some extra benefit, you know, from having your experience, you know, supervised and to their eye. But at the same time, you know, there are uh increasing number of poorly trained, you know, shamans who, you know, may be you know, more or less unscrupulous in their practices. They may charge a lot of money, give bad ayahuasca, right. uh, you know, sexually abuse, you know, their, you know, clients, uh, take them for a lot of money. So I think you can experience the states that these drugs, you know, lead one to, you know, recreationally, mm-hmm. if you're, you know, thinking about using that term as, you know, relaxation or creativity or pleasure, those, you know, kinds of motivations. You know, if you're interested in, you know, doing, you know, psychotherapy either on yourself or in a group, let's say, you know, it can be helpful to have a trained, you know, psychotherapist who, in you know, some ways, you know, their duties or responsibilities overlap with those of a shaman. You know, there still isn't really a clerical model within the West, you know, for the use of these plants or drugs, you know, like rabbis or priests or Zen masters aren't giving these, you know, substances within the context of, you know, their, you know, religious environment. So I think, uh, you know, that is still going to be, uh, you know, point of some contention and uh, interesting, you know, to watch its development. I wanted to ask you about the 1950s seemed to be uh, a time where uh, there were experiments carried out using psychedelics. And in your book, you uh, mentioned one in particular called, and pardon me if I butcher the name (laughs) and feel free to correct me, but I believe it's pronounced Thoracene. And it was described as, uh, quote, the single greatest advance in the history of psychiatric care. And the drug um, made it possible for uh, seriously mentally ill patients to improve and leave the asylums in large numbers. So it seems that people were finding the uh, benefits of using these um, chemicals to treat people with uh, mental disorders. At what point did psychedelics become taboo and a bad thing and vilified (laughs) in society? Well, so the three, you know, legs of what I call the tripod of modern psychopharmacology, mm-hmm. uh, which is responsible for all of the antidepressants out there now, the stimulants, the antipsychotic medications, you know, the nootropics, you know, the mood stabilizers, mm-hmm. you know, those all kind of, uh, you know, stand upon the tripod of psychopharmacology, which was first established in the late 1940s. And at that time, there were three discoveries. One discovery um, was the presence of, you know, serotonin mm-hmm. as a neurotransmitter in the human brain. You know, that, you know, was the first known neurotransmitter, a chemical responsible for the communication between, you know, nerve cells in the brain. Mm-hmm. The second, you know, discovery at around that time um, were the effects of LSD, um, which was 
potent in extremely small quantities, right. you know, like um, 10 times the potency. Wow. Let's see, um, like, you know, 1,000 times the potency of, you know, mescaline, you know, which had been, uh, you know, previously studied in humans, but because of the large, you know, doses that, you know, needed to be given and, you know, the general, you know, toxicity, the vomiting and the diarrhea with a big dose of mescaline, it, you know, never, you know, became especially popular within psychiatry, you know, but LSD was discovered in, you know, the 1940s and it was potent and, you know, thousands of, you know, times uh, as uh, strong as mescaline was. And uh, the third, you know, leg of the tripod um, was, you know, the discovery of the drug you know, chlorpromazine, its, you know, trade name is Thorazine, and it's an antipsychotic drug. It was used to treat schizophrenics, uh, and as a result, there was a huge exodus of, you know, chronically ill mental patients who were, you know, finally able to have their symptoms, you know, placed under, uh, you know, moderate amount of control. And it, it was interesting because all three of those compounds are, you know, related in, you know, some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, Thorazine uh, mm -hmm. is a blockader of, you know, the receptors in the brain, which are, you know, turned on by serotonin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a chemical, you know, pharmacological, you know, similarity between LSD and serotonin. Um, you know, Thorazine would block the effects of LSD. You know, so all three of those, you know, drugs were, you know, related chemically and, you know, pharmacologically. You know, LSD was studied quite extensively in the 40s and the 50s and uh, the 60s, and it was used in a number of different contexts. You know, one of the ways, you know, was to understand, you know, how, you know, mental illness occurred. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people um, within the research community, you know, called um, LSD and, you know, similar drugs, you know, psychotomimetic drugs. In other words, you know, they mimic, you know, features of naturally occurring psychosis. And, you know, they figured if you could, you know, temporarily cause a, you know, psychotic state with LSD, you might be able to understand its, you know, physiology and maybe even develop some cures. Another context for giving LSD during that time was to treat mental illness. Um, and, you know, there was a huge, you know, literature which was accumulated in describing the use of LSD and related compounds, you know, for neurosis, uh, for depression, for drug abuse, alcoholism and heroin abuse, uh, you know, PTSD, autism, uh, post-traumatic stress, um, you know, cases of OCD, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, that was an extremely promising area. You know, there was another, uh, you know, area in which people in training who were interested in empathizing with, you know, their psychotic patients, mm -hmm. you know, were given LSD as a temporary psychosis. And, you know, that was, you know, supposed to increase their empathy or understanding mm -hmm of the mental state of, of other patients. You know, there were some, you know, kind of early um, attempts to understand, you know, the biology of LSD, but, mm -hmm. you know, things were still at kind of a, you know, rudimentary stage, uh, you know, before all of the human research ended. Um, also, after, you know, there was the discovery of DMT in human beings, you know, there was a lot of interest in, you know, comparing the DMT state to schizophrenia, you know, there were quite a few um, attempts, you know, to compare the concentrations of DMT and, you know, normal controls, you know, versus the concentrations in, you know, psychiatrically ill individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, so those, you know, were the main, you know, contexts, mm -hmm. you know, for the psychedelic, you know, research community at the time. Oh, oh, also speaking of, you know, psychotherapy, there was also, you know, some interest in using these compounds to help ease the anguish of a terminal illness diagnosis, you know, right. you know, so LSD and related compounds were used to help with, you know, cancer patients who were dying and in pain and depressed and anxious. Wow. Um, but, you know, human studies all ended with the epidemic of, well, the public health problems, which accompanied all of the, you know, widespread uncontrolled use of these drugs in uh, the 60s, early 70s. And, you know, they were all scheduled uh, right. and were quite, you know, difficult, you know, to use after that point in human research. You know, that occurred in uh, the year 1970. You know, so, yeah, it, it was almost 20 years, you know, that human studies, you know, went into, uh, you know, hibernation. Mm -hmm. 
and until my DMT study got off the ground in late, you know, 1990. Just a, a quick question. You were talking about, you know, the, the drugs were scheduled and DMT, uh, according to the Drug Enforcement Administration, is a, is a Schedule One drug, which is grouped in with other drugs like heroin, LSD, marijuana, ecstasy, and peyote. A Schedule One drug is a drug considered to be the most uh, dangerous class of drugs with a high potential for abuse and potentially severe psychological and or physical dependency. Terrence McKenna, however, is famously quoted as saying that uh, psychedelics are illegal not because of a uh, loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally lay down models of behavior and information processing. They open you up to the possibility that everything you know is wrong. What are your thoughts on Terrence McKenna's uh, a statement? Do you think that that could be a reason why things like DMT and LSD were classified as such dangerous drugs? No. I just don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a lot of people jumping out of third story windows um, after taking LSD. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my, you know, good buddies on the track team and, you know, in high school, you know, was in a hotel you know, room in Las Vegas, took LSD, you know, thought he could fly, jumped out the window okay. and died. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, those weren't apocryphal stories. You know, they were actually taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think with an increasing amount of those reports coming in, you know, the government freaked. I mean, they thought, you know, this is bad. You know, yeah. these are bad drugs and we have to restrict their availability and increase penalties, you know, for possession, manufacture, distribution. You know, so I think it was compounded in, you know, some ways by, you know, folks like Tim Leary who were, you know, telling Mm -hmm. everybody to take these drugs yeah. and, uh, you know, free your mind, you know, tune in, you know, turn on and, and, you know, drop out. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think people were worried that, you know, it was a huge, you know, wave of enlightenment that was, um, spreading across the West, but a huge, you know, wave of adverse, you know, psychiatric effects. I think that, you know, by and large, you know, the government, you know, really doesn't care mm -hmm. if everybody's enlightened or not. You know, but they do care if people are freaking out, ending up in hospitals. Right. You know, kind of gouging out their eyes, jumping out of buildings. You know, so I think, you know, they were responding to what they consider to be a you know, public health epidemic. Mm -hmm. And they had to do what they could as quickly as they could. But, you know... If you look at the congressional hearings for scheduling these, you know, drugs, it's, you know, quite interesting, you know, because all of, you know, the psychiatrists, you know, were saying, yeah, yeah, these drugs can be dangerous if they're misused, but, yeah. you know, trust us, you know, we're doctors and we can, you know, keep, a, you know, grip on things. But the congressmen were saying, well, obviously not, you know, look at Tim Leary. Uh, I mean, he's a <laughs> right. scientist and right. he's right. You know, promoting all kinds of you know, crazy stuff. So yeah. um, I think that, you know, legitimate, you know, psychiatric research got caught in, you know, some serious, you know, crossfire. And, uh, you know, the subtleties of, you know, set and setting, you know, supervision, mm -hmm. you know, preparation and, you know, follow up were, you know, lost on uh, the lawmakers who, you know, saw, I guess, you know, somewhat of a chance to score political points as, you know, being concerned with, you know, public health. But um, I also think that, uh, you know, the scientists could have done a better job in both educating the population and also to, you know, keep a, you know, shorter leash on, you know, some of the more, you know, wild-eyed claims that were, you know, coming out. Um, and, you know, if you look at the media coverage now uh, with, you know, the renaissance of human psychedelic research, mm -hmm. it's completely night and day. The media is interested and respectful. They're not making, uh, you know, crazy claims that these drugs were established to be unsafe and couldn't be used no matter what. You know, they're quite, yeah. you know, level-headed in, you know, their reporting of, you know, contemporary scientific research. But at the same time, uh, this new generation of, you know, researchers is being a lot more circumspect in their claims as to what these drugs do what their potential benefits are, what their potential risks are, as opposed to, you know, saying they're all good or, you know, they're all bad. Both, you know, the scientific and the media communities, you know, seem to be able to be 
presenting it in a lot more of a nuanced you know, manner than occurred the first time around. I have a question or at least a thought going back to the more technical side of things. And a while ago, I was reading about progesterone and how it's an antagonist for the, um, the sigma receptors. And um, at the same time, I was reading about DMT being an agonist for the sigma-1 receptor. So um, when I you know, read the section in your book, and unfortunately, you weren't able to carry out the research to the full, but you did briefly research the menstrual cycle potentially affecting DMT or other psychedelic experiences. So my question is that if progesterone is an antagonist for sigma-1 receptors and DMT is an agonist, there's the idea basically then that women could experience DMT or similar things differently or in fact, you know, at a reduced lower rate and what the implications of that would be, if that makes sense. Sorry, I'm I'm not an expert yeah. in these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, I think that's a very good question. And in my study of DMT, we standardized when in the menstrual cycle we brought people in mm-hmm. in order to keep things to as you know, kind of you know, regulated a manner as we could. You know, we usually brought people in within the first you know week of their cycle. You know, like after the bleeding stopped. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that is uh, the time, you know, that the hormonal, you know, milieu in a woman is the closest, you know, to that of a man. Mm-hmm. You, you know, the estrogen levels are pretty low. The mm-hmm. progesterone levels are pretty low. And, yeah, it you know, seemed as a result of, you know, the basic you know, science of estrogen, you know, modifying the number and the you know, properties of you know, the serotonin receptor. It also you know, modifies you know, the serotonin receptor. Yeah. And most of the, the attention to understanding how the, you know, the psychedelics you know, work in the brain have been focusing on the serotonin receptors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I was interested in, you know, determining is there um, any modification of, you know, the DMT response across the cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think we studied just, you know, one woman, and it was only at a couple of points in the cycle. I didn't get any funding to do that study, you know, so we really couldn't expand it very much. And, you know, the Sigma site is also an increasingly, you know, focused upon area Mm -hmm. of the psychedelics, you know, DMT and other compounds. Um, Also, you know, there is increasing um, information about the crosstalk between the serotonin and the glutamate system. Mm-hmm. So um, I think all of those are, uh, you know, changing over this, um, over the, uh, you know, course of the stages of the menstrual cycle and even after menopause as well or even before, you know, menstruation begins. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there is interest, you know, from NIH to, you know, look at, you know, women's responses to, uh, you know, new agents, you know, new drugs, antibiotics, steroids, yeah. um, you know, psychoactive drugs, especially the antidepressants and antipsychotics. But, you know, to my knowledge, I don't think there's really any human research going on at this point, you know, looking at that question. You know, does the response to psychedelics, you know, change over the cycle? Yeah, I mean, I guess my question was motivated by the idea of, um, you know, if DMT really is a spirit molecule, if it's a a true spiritual experience, then it's interesting to question why some people or of a, you know, of a certain gender should experience more intense things. That was... That was it, basically. <laughs> yeah, you know, I suppose if if you speak to you know people that have a lot of experience giving ayahuasca mm-hmm. or, um, or taking ayahuasca, because you know there's a lot more you know people drinking ayahuasca than there are using DMT, I think. Yeah. And uh, I would imagine if you queried those groups, you would get some interesting you know data regarding mm-hmm. um, menstrual uh, you know cycle you know modifications of you know people's experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just not that familiar with any of those data. Yeah. With respect to DMT, I suppose naturally occurring DMT, perhaps, you know, mediating non-drug spiritual states, um, you know, that still is speculative. We don't really you know, have the capability to measure naturally occurring DMT in humans. The concentrations are just, you know, too low yeah. for our present technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it, you know, could be, you know, that women, you know, may produce more DMT 
at certain times of the month, or they might be more responsive to it. But, you know, they may be you know, more responsive to their naturally produced, you know, DMT um, over the menstrual cycle. And, you know, that, you know, may mean that, you know, women, if, you know, they're meditating in a retreat for a month, they, you know, may you know, possibly be more prone to experience a spiritual state as a result of prayer or of meditation mm-hmm. um, at a certain you know, time of the you know, month and others. You know, so, you know, so that'd be interesting. I mean, you yeah. could, uh, you know, kind of increase or, you know, change your meditation and practice, mm-hmm. you know, depending on, you know, the time of the month, comparable to the ayahuasca communities out there. You know, there must be data. Yeah, you know, within the contemplative communities, describing you know different yeah. you know rates of enlightenment or kensho or you know satori in their you know female practitioners. Prior to your research, uh, which we're going to get into here in just a few uh, short minutes, there had been a ban on these type of studies, and before the ban, um, you know, psychedelics and and some DMT uh, research had occurred on animals and on humans. Um, so it's another two-part question, if I may. Number one, what was there to learn testing or uh, psychedelics on animals? And number two, what was different about the uh, DMT research done in humans back then to the research you would eventually go on and do uh, years later? Well, I think what occurred after the ban of human studies was, you know, that you, you know was that you know research with animals continued. Mm. Um, so the interest, you know, was on you know, biology of LSD and related drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to kind of um, establish a, you know, uh, establish an animal model of the psychedelic, you know, drug effect, mm-hmm. which you know is increasingly, you know, been refined over the decades. But uh, I think. You know, primarily it's been focused on you know the biology of these drugs, mm-hmm. and uh, as a result of LSD studies, you know that was kind of responsible you know for the you know determination of the different you know, subtypes of the serotonin receptors out there. Yeah. You know, that occurred in the early 1980s. I think that quite a few of the animal studies, which ultimately you know led you know, to the development of the, you know, serotonin reuptake, you know, blocking antidepressants mm-hmm. like Prozac. Um, all of them used LSD as a probe of, you know, serotonin function, um, mm-hmm. which helped explicate and advance our understanding of how antidepressants worked. You know, another way in which animals were used uh, in, you know, the you know, during the 20-year hiatus, you know, was to understand, you know, similarities and the differences between the various, you know, psychedelic drugs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there is a model which was developed, which is still in current use, which is called the, you know, drug discrimination model. And in that, you know, model, well, you give an animal some LSD and it learns to, you know, recognize, you know, the inner state which, you mm-hmm. know, the drug will cause. Yeah. And you can tie the inner state of the animal mm-hmm. in response to the LSD, you know, to being fed. You know, so if yeah. an animal is on LSD and it presses a bar, it will get fed. If it isn't on LSD, it will press the bar and it won't get fed. You know, so... um uh, you know, so you can, you know, you, you can train an animal, to, you know, to respond to LSD or, you know, to recognize LSD. And, you know, then you can give other drugs like DMT or DOI or, you know, psilocybin or, you know, 5-methoxy-DMT. Mm-hmm. And you can, you know, determine, you know, by the, you know, similarity in the, you know, bar pressing response the degree of you know similarity of um, of the inner state that's being reported by the lower animal you know so that even though it's crude it still is you know uh, you know pretty sensitive uh, in you know terms of one being able to determine that a new drug is LSD like or not LSD like mm-hmm. but but still the gold standard is you give it to a human and you ask them you know to compare the effects so with respect to your question, you know, about comparing DMT studies now and DMT studies, you know, back in the day. You know, the emphasis on, you know, DMT in the, you know, 60s was to understand its, you know, role in 
you know, psychosis, especially schizophrenia. You know, so, you know, people were, you know, looking at, you know, levels in the blood of DMT and metabolites in, you know, normal controls versus schizophrenics. Yeah. And, you know, also they were giving DMT to, you know, normal controls and then comparing the responses to schizophrenics or else giving DMT to schizophrenics and asking, you know, the other patients, you know, to compare, you know, the hallucinations or the visions on DMT mm-hmm. with, you know, those which would occur, you know, naturally in the course of their illness. Um, you know, so, you know, that was kind of the emphasis at, at uh, the time. Uh, you know, there wasn't any you know, therapeutic emphasis per se. Yeah. You know, there were some studies with a compound like DMT, which is called, you know, DPT. It isn't found in nature. It's a laboratory, you know, creation. Mm. Okay. And uh, it was used as within the context of, you know, substance abuse, you know, treatment protocols you know, like, you know, for alcoholism and, Mm -hmm. you know, for heroin abuse. And it was also used um, in some protocols for the terminally ill. But, you know, DPT is kind of a chemical, you know, curiosity as, you know, much as anything. Mm -hmm. Um, It isn't especially, you know, popular on the street and it isn't, uh, you know, being, you know, studied scientifically um, at this point. It isn't a you know, compound that is, you know, found in nature at all. Uh, you know, current studies with, you know, DMT have been pretty few. You know, there was, you know, my study in which, yeah. you know, case we were just interested in, you know, characterizing its responses or, you know, the responses in our volunteers. You know, they were normal volunteers. They were all experienced with, you know, psychedelics. And I was asking, you know, biological, you know, psychological kinds of questions. You know, we weren't, you know, doing any treatment of any sort. You know, we were just, you know, giving as much, you know, DMT to as many people as we could and, you know, seeing what the biological responses were and the psychological responses. You know, once we completed that uh, study, we looked at tolerance, you know, giving DMT repeatedly over the space of the morning, you know, uh, you know, to determine if, you know, people's responses lessened right. with repeated exposure, which is the case with all of the other drugs out there like LSD. And, you know, we discovered that, you know, people didn't, you know, develop tolerance, that, that the fourth, you know, dose of DNT was as powerful as the first. Um, so then we started looking at, you know, some of the specific you know kinds of, you know, serotonin receptors mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. were, you know, mediating the DMT effect. Mm-hmm. You know, there was one study after ours giving pure DMT. It was a study in Germany, and you know they were you know comparing the responses of DMT to the responses to ketamine, uh, which is also a psychedelic agent in smaller doses. Um, usually, it's used as an anesthetic agent, but if you give smaller doses, it's pretty psychedelic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was a comparison study giving a continuous infusion of DMT over several hours with a continuous infusion of ketamine over, um, over several hours. And, you know, their specific question, you know, was to compare uh, specific, you know, types of, you know, psychotic symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, in other words, you know, if you gave, you know, DMT was, you know, that, you know, more like, you know, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And if you gave, you know, ketamine, you know, did that cause the negative symptoms of mm-hmm. schizophrenia? Mm-hmm. You know, so that was kind of a European, you know, model, you know, the psychotomimetic model of, you know, the psychedelic, you know, drug effect. Yeah. You know, so those are, you know, really the only two DMT projects which um, have occurred, you know, since you know, the renewal of human studies. You know, there have been a larger number of ayahuasca studies, which, you know, it's, as we were talking about earlier, it contains an orally active, you know, version of DMT. You know, most of those ayahuasca studies have, you know, taken place in, in, you know, Barcelona, Spain. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, those have, you know, mostly been, you know, biological as well, uh, understanding the responses in the brain, mm-hmm. endocrine or hormonal responses, sleep effects, you know, those kinds of things. You know, they haven't been, you know, therapeutic or, or spiritual in yeah. orientation. Um, on that note, um, I've got a quick question. Have MAOIs ever been researched in conjunction with DMT? Because it seems that that would at least imitate ayahuasca to some extent. Well, there's quite a bit of information from the field anyway. You know, people combining either 
pure DMT with botanical MAO inhibitors, like mm-hmm. is you know found in the Banisteriopsis plant, or in you know Syrian rue, or you know Peganum harmala, you know some of the other uh, plants which contain an MAO inhibitor. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know people have combined pure DMT with you know pharmaceutical monoamine oxidase inhibitors, mm-hmm. like meclobamide. Um, but I don't think there have been any real human studies recently combining MAO inhibitors with giving DMT. You know, I've heard stories of people smoking DMT after pre-treating with an MAO inhibitor, okay. or they've even taken an MAO inhibitor and then, you know, taken psilocybin. Okay. Um, you know, that seems kind of you know, hair-raising. The, the experiences um, are prolonged, or as you'd expect? Yeah, it's prolonged and more intense, and you can get a little more toxic, you know, a bit more confused and, you know, delirious. Okay. You know, one of the questions about if you blockade MAO, are you able to then, you know, measure levels of DMT, which occur naturally okay. uh, because in the case of ayahuasca when you combine an MAO inhibitor with DMT you get high concentrations of the nitrogen oxide of DMT which are even higher concentrations than concentrations of you know DMT itself you know so there was a little pilot study that just occurred at UC Berkeley you know giving an MAO inhibitor to people for a couple of days mm-hmm. and you know then collect their urine in an attempt to discover like if you give an MAO inhibitor in the normal state, would you then be able, you know, to measure this nitrogen oxide, you know, because you aren't able, you know, to measure the parent compound with current technology. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that uh, study seems to have been a negative result. Either the MAO, you know, wasn't given in a high enough dose or at the right time. Those kinds of uh, questions still remain to be clarified. But uh, like if a normal person, you know, takes an MAO inhibitor, um, you know, you're not going to increase your levels of, you know, DMT to the point of having yeah. a, you know, so-called, you know, naturally occurring DMT experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you were getting ready to start your uh, research, you know, I've heard that you can administer DMT, you know, you can smoke it, you can snort it, you can administer it via IV. And I know that also you tried intramuscular injection. Which method proved to be the best for your research and why? Well, the first group of uh, studies giving, you know, DMT in humans all gave it in the intramuscular route, you know, the Hungarian studies and the American studies. There was one study where they gave it intravenously to some schizophrenic lady whose heart stopped beating and uh, they had to resuscitate her and it was kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I think everybody was, you know, keen on giving it as an intramuscular dose. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was getting my, you know, funding from the National Institute on, you know, drug abuse. And uh, one of the, you know, rationales for requesting, you know, funding from them you know, was uh, within the context of, you know, DMT being an abused drug, you know, like a minor abused drug, but still it it was, you know, being, uh, you know, used on the streets. And if we understood its effects, um, we might then be able to understand, you know, those of more popular drugs like LSD and, and, you know, psilocybin. You know, so I was, you know, keen on, you know, reproducing the smoked effect. Um, Mm -hmm. which is the way it's used most often in, uh, you know, recreationally or in the field. And by smoke DMT, I'm referring to vaporizing the free base of DMT. And after that, you, you know, would inhale, you know, the vaporized drug. You know, that's what's called smoking DMT. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there were a couple of volunteers in our early, you know, group of uh, individuals who had smoked DMT. And because I was interested in, you know, replicating the smoked effect, you know, psychologically, you know, we gave them an intramuscular dose of DMT. And, you know, we asked that, you know, person, you know, to compare it to the smoked effect. Right. And... Well, so his description of the intra, you know, muscular route was that it was a lot slower and, you know, wasn't as intense mm-hmm. as the smoked effect. 
you know, so then we, you know, switched over rather quickly to the intravenous route. And uh, it, you know, seemed to replicate the smoked effect. Mm -hmm. And it even may have been like a half step quicker, you know, than the response to smoking DMT. Well, you know, one thing, if any of your listeners aren't, you know, familiar with the DMT effect, mm -hmm. if it's either smoked or injected intravenously, it begins to work within a heartbeat or two. And the effects, you know, peak within a couple of minutes and start to resolve within about, you know, five or ten minutes. And they're pretty much gone within a half hour to 40 minutes. Yeah, I've heard it described as being shot out of a cannon in the past. Now, there's a question in the chat that I want to ask you, and it will kind of segue to my next question. But uh, Professor Mann is in the chat. He's asking, how many times has he, Dr. Strassman, done DMT himself? Did, did you try uh, this on yourself before you went into your uh, research or not? Well, so that is a you know question that I am posed a number of times, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got kind of a stock answer. You know, mm -hmm. um, if I tell people that I have, yeah. then I'll be accused of being a zealot, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> if I tell people I've not, I'll be accused of not knowing what I'm talking about. You know, so that's my answer. I you know, see. my answer also is what is the motivation behind that question? Mm -hmm. wow. you, you know, I'm reporting people's experiences. Yeah. yeah. Like, I gave this drug and I took careful notes and I drew blood. And, you know, that's what I'm talking about. There are you know, so many self-reports of I smoke DMT and, mm -hmm. you know, now I have the answer to the beginning of the universe and why, you know, mm -hmm. things are as they are. It just isn't that useful, um, even if you're the most objective and clear-eyed person in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, your experience is your experience. So yeah. I, you know, said about you know collecting as much information as I could from a, a sophisticated and uh, intelligent group of you know subjects as I could, mm -hmm. and you know documented you know that as carefully as I could. And, you know, that's what I've written about, that's what I've talked about, that's what I've speculated about. Um, related to that, then, do you ever release any personal information about yourself as regards, you know, your spiritual or religious beliefs? Or do you make a point to keep that separate? No, no, I'm a lot more comfortable, you know, talking uh, um, about that because it's influenced my approach to the work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't talk about my own religious experiences. Okay per se, but um, I do talk about, in my first DMT book, the spiritual approach that I had you know, brought to bear on my study. Um, I had uh, spent a number of years practicing and studying within a Zen Buddhist community or uh, extended organization, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I approached, you know, people's, you know, drug experiences from that perspective, like it was kind of an um, I didn't really intrude much on people's experiences. Yeah. Um, there weren't any, you know, props, you know, so to speak. Um, I just let, you know, people have their own experience. You know, kind of like, you know, the bare bones, you know, Zen practice, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, bells and mandalas and incense and candles and chanting yeah. and mudras and mantras and whatnot. It, it was more like I was interested in, you know, creating a space where you know people can have whatever experience you know was going to happen and also our approach to you know people's experiences was you know kind of hands off we would you know kind of enter into a light state of meditation to stay alert to what was going on in the room and within ourselves but uh you know, we didn't ask a lot of questions. We didn't massage people or hold their hands. If, you know, they needed help, you know, we provided it. But, you know, generally, we just, you know, kept uh, a few steps removed. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, developed, you know, the rating scale that we used to quantify the DMT effect using Buddhist psychological principles. Mm -hmm. well, you know, so I speak about that in my DMT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was also, you know, kind of expecting, you know, based on my you know, Buddhist experience, you know, that the ultimate effect of the DMT, you know, high dose would be an enlightenment-like state. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I am up front with, you know, the influence of my, you know, religious, you know, background on the study itself, you know, how I 
conceived of the study, you know, how I performed it, what my expectations were, the, you know, means of um, of interpreting people's experiences. Dr. Stressman, I wanted to ask you about the uh, brave group of people you found to help you in your research. What can you tell me about the volunteers? What what were you looking for when, when you began to look for volunteers for this study? Well, I was interested in, you know, psychologically healthy people, you know, medically healthy people, mm -hmm. um, you know, with some experience with, you know, the psychedelic, you know, drugs. You know, the first group of, you know, volunteers, as it turned out, were my friends, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who were kind of rooting me on from the sidelines for uh -huh. the couple of years, you know, that it took to, to get my study off the ground. But yeah, you know, um, you know, once I got permission, I just, you know, put out the word mm -hmm. and uh, people were lining up. I bet. Um, um, it was a you know, sophisticated and intelligent group of, you know, people. You know, there were doctors, you know, psychologists, you know, teachers, you know, scientists, you know, physicians, bureaucrats, uh, school teachers. There was a couple of graduate students. There was a nurse or two, you know, science writers, mathematicians. Yeah, um, I, I screened people very carefully. Um, I would screen people by asking them um, a couple of, you know, pointed questions. You know, one question would be, you know, what's the highest you've ever been? Mm -hmm. Well, and another question was, you know, what's the most scared and regressed you've ever been on, you know, the psychedelics? And, you know, the reason, you know, that I asked, you know, that question, you know, was in order, you know, to gauge, you know, the inner resources mm -hmm. of the potential volunteers. Like, you know, you know, what would they do or, you know, what would happen mm -hmm. if they began to panic or found themselves in a tight spot on the, you know, DMT effect? You know, there was one guy, a young guy, and I asked him that question as, you know, part of the screening interview and uh, he you know told me that every time he took a large you know dose of mushrooms he would find himself on the roof of a house or of a building and he never you know knew how he got up there That's and scary. it was always a hassle to get down wow <laughs> That's scary. so I said to him and myself uh, I just don't think you're really cut out for this study <laughs> yeah yeah you know so those wow. kinds of you know questions were important mm -hmm. um, I screened people medically as well uh mm -hmm. I excluded anybody with high blood pressure mm -hmm. or any heart disease, um, any thyroid disease, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Yeah, you know, so it was quite, you know, difficult to get into the study. And I actually was, you know, discouraging most people like, you know, this is going to be really intense and mm -hmm. you're going to be in the hospital and you will have a couple of intravenous lines in place. Uh, you won't be able to move going to smell bad in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think as a result of, you know, getting people to understand, you know, the rigors of the study, uh, you know, before, you know, they got involved. I think it increased the percentage of people um, who were volunteering for altruistic purposes, um, you know, much more than just like a new, you know, drug experience, you know, because as a result uh, of my screening out, you know, people who weren't especially, you know, serious about the, you know, demands of the protocol, they were interested in, you know, the potential benefits of these drugs, both spiritual and, you know, psychological, even medical. And, you know, they were agreeable and, and you know, they were willing, you know, to do whatever it took in order to increase our, you know, knowledge about them. Mm -hmm. When your uh, research began and you, you know, started to compile your reports on what the volunteers experience. In your book, you talk about how uh, you could divide them into three major categories, personal, invisible, and transpersonal experiences. Can you tell me a little bit about these three categories and what are the characteristics of each of them? Um, so the personal kinds of experiences were either on, you know, the lower doses or took place on people that, you know, didn't have what would be called spiritual or, you know, breakthrough experiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those were more along the lines of what might occur in, you know, psychotherapy. You know, like, I guess, you know, psychotherapy on steroids or, you know, turbocharge, yeah. you know, psychotherapy. You know, the, you know, they would be able to, you know, work through individual conflicts, concerns, problems, emotional, you know, blockages, you know, you know psychosomatic symptoms or pain, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, some ways, uh, you know, like if, you know, they had, uh, you know, some visions, uh, they would be a little more, you know, consistent with a dream-like state, in which case the contents of, you know, the visions seem to be more, 
you know, related you know, to their own psychology than mm-hmm. perhaps some external reality out there that they were tapping into. You know, the transpersonal states were the more spiritual ones where they, um, I guess, you know, you might, you know, call them the near death like states, mm-hmm. uh, the more, you know, mystical states, you know, kind of union with the one with the white light. You know, the invisible, uh, the experiences of the invisible worlds were the more unexpected, uh, you know, category mm-hmm. and actually were the most common, especially mm-hmm. after the high doses. Right. And, you know, these were reports that the volunteers returned with of entering into a world of light, which, you know, seemed inhabited by, you know, sentient beings mm-hmm. who expected them, uh, interacted with them for good and for ill, were aware of them. The volunteers could uh, interact with them quite, you know, fulsomely, mm-hmm. ask questions, get answers, you know, negotiate and bargain. Um, you know, so those were the more unexpected, you know, kinds of effects, which ended up actually, you know, being the more, or, you know, the most, you know, common, uh, especially after the high doses. Before uh, we touch on some of these entities, I've heard stories from people who have encountered beings on other substances like LSD or after taking mushrooms, etc. Um, however, you say in your book, uh, and, and I apologize, I hope I'm not taking it out of context, but you said in your book that only with the MT do people meet up with quote unquote them with other beings in a non-material world. So my question is, uh, are DMT encounters uh, more real? Whereas encounters with entities using other substances are or could be mere hallucinations or, or, or just dreams. Well, the comment about, you know, only with DMT does, you know, somebody, you know, report the, the, the contact with beings. Um, I, I think at the time when I wrote that, I was referring to the scientific literature, okay. mm-hmm. um, you know, because, you know, some of the Hungarian studies uh described you know you know contact with beings in you know the 1950s 1960s you know if you would read through you know the literature or you know the scientific literature on LSD and you know psilocybin there weren't any reports of being contact and even in the field you know um the prevalence of contact with beings on other drugs than DMT is pretty rare but you know DMT is you know kind of notorious or you know famous or infamous you know for reliably uh, producing contact with beings you know so the location of the beings you know what's their nature you know where do they reside what's their function uh, I mean obviously you know those are enormously huge questions ontologically epistemologically heuristically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, psychological, spiritual, yeah. you know, and you can, I think, you know, choose from any number of, you know, potential options, you know, right now, because, you know, the jury is out, you know, yeah. nobody has, you know, said, you know, for sure these beings are just, you know, the product of abnormal brain metabolism, you know, nobody, you know, has, you know, definitely establish, you know, that they're extra, you know, terrestrials, which we contact through our mind-brain complex being modified by DMT, mm-hmm. or, you know, something in between, they're just a dream, or they're just a, you know, psychological construct, you know, representing right. something else. You know, I think we ought to be open to, you know, whatever they are. You know, when you're asking about what kind of DMT work is going on, you know, nowadays compared to the first, you know, wave of studies, you know, I, I think, you know, one thing which would be, you know, very important to, you know, look at mm-hmm. uh, um, is to study the DMT beings, you know, right. to really uh, look, you know, carefully at what they're, you know, you know, nature is. And, you know, for example, you could give a continuous infusion of DMT for an hour or two or three hours, and uh, you can increase the dose, decrease, you know, the dose over the space of the study session. And you could get people to work with the beings, to describe them, to ask them questions, you know, to really kind of flesh them out. When you smoke DMT or you give it just as a one-shot you know, shot injection, it's, you know, it's over so quickly. You know, the element of being so stunned as a result of finding yourself in this world um, can be, uh, you know, kind of disorienting and you're not able to interact with the beings at quite the same you know, level that you could with a slower, more continuous mm-hmm. uh, kind of effect. You know, um, 
there's you know quite a bit of information out there with ayahuasca mm -hmm. but uh you know because that's a longer acting experience it takes about an hour to start working mm -hmm. and is over in about you know six hours or so and you know, the peak effects might you know have a duration of an hour or two you know so you can interact you know with the beings but mm -hmm. you know it's it's not quite as controlled an environment, let's say, as what would occur in a laboratory setting. Right. With, you know, pure DMT that the levels were going up and down, you know, depending on one's response. You know, so I, I think it would be, you know, very important to, you know, look at the DMT beings to correlate mm -hmm. the descriptions of the beings with the personality of the research, you know, volunteer. Like if you have a neurotic volunteer, will their beings be of a particular type mm -hmm. and function? If you have a healthy volunteer, mm -hmm. if you have a spiritually oriented one, if you have a Jewish one, a Buddhist one, a Christian one, a Muslim one, you know, what is, you know, the nature of the beings, you know, relative, you know, to the person encountering them? And it, you know, may turn out that they're just, you know, purely a result of the brain being on drugs, or they could be uh external beings uh, that exist on another level of reality mm -hmm. um you know there are some you know models you know you know could contain you know that idea like dark matter and you know parallel universes mm -hmm. so uh i think uh it's important to you know characterize the beings to a lot greater extent than the hit and miss approach that has uh you know, kind of taken place up until now. Following on from what you were just saying, kind of more of a philosophical question, but do you think it matters in the same way that people question Robert Nozick's experience machine? Do you think it matters then whether the experiences on DMT are, so to say, real or possibly just completely hallucinogenic if the effect that, you know, people come out with is a positive one? Well, yeah, yeah, the, the whole, you know, question mm -hmm. uh, of the, you know, reality basis of the DMT state, it gets kind of complicated when you look at, you know, the science. Um, you know, one of the, you know, very curious, you know, properties of DMT is that it's transported into the brain uh, across the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. using energy that the brain expends in order to get, you know, DMT into it. And, you know, there are you know, very few, you know, substances that the brain treats that way. You know, the only, you know, substances, you know, seem to be ones which are required for normal brain function, like blood sugar and certain amino acids necessary for the, you know, synthesis of proteins, which the brain isn't able to, you know, make on its own. You know, so if you, you know, think about, you know, the, you know, philosophical implications, you know, of, you know, DMT, you know, seemingly, you know, being required for normal brain function, yeah. you know, that is kind of mind boggling, mm -hmm. you know, like on its own, you know, because, you know, normal brain function, it equates with, you know, normal consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, so it, you know, may be that a specific, you know, window of brain DMT is required for our, you know, perception of, you know, consensual reality, you know, like, you know, DMT could be some kind of, you know, reality thermostat or an endomatrix, you know, it's, you know, the matrix, which mm -hmm. the brain is, you know, you know, kind of generating on its own, which, you know, gives coherence, you know, to everyday reality. And it gets even, you know, more specific if you look at, you know, you know some more recent data, um, which, uh, you know, came out of the University of Wisconsin a few years ago, in which, you know, case the activity of the gene responsible for the enzyme that makes you know DMT mm -hmm. is quite active in the retina. Okay. Um, you know, so it you know may be that you know DMT is you know mediating our you know general you know perception of the world and specifically our you know visual perception of the world. You know, so that begins to you know beg the question of you know what is real and you know what may be just a very elaborate you know DMT you know hallucination. But uh, still, I mean, even if you know that were the case, you still have to think about why things are configured that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, why is it that the brain requires DMT? You know, yeah. like you know, I mean, either who or 
you know, what, you know, design things in you know, such a manner, mm-hmm. you know, so I think you're still, you know, left with an external locus at a certain point, you know, people didn't, you know, just come out of the blue, you know, people were created, the universe, you know, was created, you know, DMT was created. And uh, I, I think it's a bit, you know, self important to believe that, you know, that we are, you know, the, you know, generator of all of our experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, you know, just as, you know, likely that we are, you know, like a recipient um, of information and experience, you know, rather than being the, uh, you know, first cause, um, as it were. You know, so I think it would impact our, you know, relationships if one wants to look very carefully at the reality basis versus, uh, you know, hallucinogenic, yeah. uh, you know, bases, you know, for these experiences, you know, would you be any less kind or any gentler, mm-hmm. any more compassionate, any more, you know, violent or any more sadistic if this were an hallucination mm-hmm. or if it weren't? So I think at a certain point, you just have to decide how you want to act and yeah. uh, then try to dig deeper, uh, with every opportunity possible. Going back to the entities which your uh, volunteers describe as, you know, clowns, reptiles, mantises, bees, spiders, cacti, stick figures. Um, from the people that I've talked to, they describe what, you know, we know in UFO lore as the greys. And in your book, you also include some accounts from your volunteers, one in particular um, who had encounters with uh, reptilian beings. And I just want to read a short uh, excerpt. He said, quote, they were reptilian and humanoid, trying to make me understand, not with words, but with gestures. They wanted me to look into their bodies. I saw inside them and understood reproduction, what it's like before birth, the passage into the body. Once I established what they were communicating, they didn't just fade away. They stayed there for quite a while. It's interesting for me to hear so many experiences that sound exactly like alien abductions. And early in your book, in the first few pages, you said, those who have undergone alien abductions and their advocates may interpret my suggestion that DMT is intimately involved in these events as a challenge to the, quote, reality of their experiences. What are you telling us here? Does DMT play a role in these cases of abductions that people have reported for, geez, I don't know, like for the last 50 years? Yeah, you know, the whole thing, thing about alien abduction and contact experience was completely off of my radar before I began my research. Mm-hmm. And well, and even, you know, while it, it was taking place, it was only afterwards uh, when my study was completed and I was starting to look around for other models by which to understand the DMT effect that I stumbled onto the alien you know, contact experience, the ET experience, Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, one of the first interviews that I had with uh, anyone after the DMT book came out was with Whitley Stryber. His first book was called Communion. And, you know, he challenged me and was saying, well, you know, there's stigma uh, with a contact experience. You know, there's, there's implants and there's burns. And also, you know, there's evidence, like there's a, a spot in the woods, which the ground's been compressed or burnt or whatnot. You know, so I began to think about a spectrum of effects of contact or a spectrum of, you know, contact experiences. You know, like on, you know, one end of the spectrum is the purely, you know, physical contact experience um, where there are implants and burns and cuts and things like that. And on the other end of the spectrum are the purely, you know, consciousness to consciousness contact experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm more thinking, you know, the DMT may possibly explain the, you know, consciousness, you know, to consciousness, you know, type of contact experience. Keep in mind that there aren't any data out there on levels of DMT in non-drug altered states like contact experiences, you know, near-death states, you know, meditation, anything like mm-hmm. that. But still, you know, to the extent that the two states resemble each other. In other words, you know, to the extent that giving DMT replicates certain, you know, features of these non-drug states, then it only makes, you know, sense that there's some underlying common biological, you know, process occurring. You know, so there's a couple of, you know, ways of, you know, looking at that. You could give DMT to people that have been abducted. And you could ask them to compare their experiences. And I don't think that's been, you know, done yet. I would imagine that, you know, 
it's occurred, you know, people that have, you know, been abducted have smoked DMT, but I haven't heard any reports within, you know, subject comparison as it were. And, you know, if in the future, you know, we are able to, you know, measure naturally occurring levels of DMT, it would be of interest to compare levels in people either, you know, being abducted or who are, you know, prone, to, you know, to being abducted to compare their levels with, you know, levels and, you know, normal controls. As a slight tangent, I also think it would be really interesting to to explore studies on identical twins in terms of DMT. That's just a side thought, but I think that would be very cool. <laughs> well, so what would you compare? Well, just to see if, you know, their biological chemical makeup and the similarity of it results in similar or potentially identical experiences or whether despite their chemical makeup they still have completely different trips i guess well you know one interesting aspect too is if you speak with identical twins you know they often will describe a kind of you know telepathy mm -hmm, uh, exactly, which exists yeah. between them you know so it would be interesting you know t uh, you know to determine if a straight identical twin would be able to kind of read the trips that a person is having on DMT yeah um, or else if they're both, you know, tripping at the same time, mm -hmm. if they're, you know, sharing the experience, you know, together. Or within the same plane, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Strassman, we're, we're quickly running right. out of time, but I just want to uh, get to uh, two more questions and a comment. The one question is from the chat room, and it goes kind of with what we are talking about right now. Uh, the question is, out of all your studies, has any two people ever had an almost identical trip <laughs> slash experience? Well, you know, there's a great consistency Mm -hmm. among trip reports. So while I don't think anybody has, you know, had like an exact same trip as, you know, somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the general contours are quite, you know, similar. Uh, you know, the onset is very rapid. There's a, a you know, feeling of your consciousness, you know, separating from your body. Mm -hmm. You enter into a world of light, uh, which is, uh, you know, full of rapidly moving, morphing, you know, buzzing, you know, shapes. Um, which, you know, coalesce into more recognizable objects with which one interacts. You know, there you know, seems to be a, you know, kind of narrow, you know, range mm -hmm. or, you know, circumscribed range of effects within this state. Quite consistent. You know, it's quite strange and it's quite consistently strange. Mm -hmm. You know, so there, you know, seems to be, you know, something that is inherent, uh, either in the person or inherent or intrinsic to the external plane of reality that, you know, people tap into uh, with, you know, DMT. It isn't like, you know, sometimes you, you know, see your body, you know, changing shape or, you know, sometimes you start laughing hysterically or, you know, sometimes you want to jump up and down. It's, you know, a lot more consistent. You know, like you quickly enter into a, you know, familiar easily recognizable alternative, you know, world, which uh, is quite, you know, comparable from person to person and within the same person from dose to dose. The other quick question we have in the chat was, can you overdose on DMT? Like overdose, like die? Yeah, I think that, that would uh, be... I've, uh, I've never heard of anybody dying on either ayahuasca mm -hmm. or on DMT. You know, there is the occasional ayahuasca, you know, death report, but yeah. if you look at them carefully, it's usually, you know, some other, you know, substance or, you know, something else, you know, that was mixed with the ayahuasca. You know, there was an ayahuasca, you know, death in Canada a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and that ended up, you know, being a you know, case of, you know, tobacco poisoning. Mm -hmm. You know, they were swallowing a lot of tobacco juice at the same time okay. they were drinking ayahuasca. Wow. And... Um, you know, there was some, you know, kid from Marin County who ended up, you know, dying at a retreat, you know, center in Peru. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was, you know, probably, you know, from San Pedro cactus, you know, like mescaline mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, God knows what else. But, uh, you know, DMT, you know, there is that, you know, uh, well, that case report of that schizophrenic woman whose heart stopped on IV DMT. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you've got a unstable heart, like mm -hmm. if you've got heart disease or you've, you know, had a heart attack, I suppose if you smoke DMT, mm -hmm. it could stress your heart to the point of having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th you know, that wouldn't be specifically the DMT, that, you know, that would be your heart disease being stressed. You know, like exercise uh, might stress your heart and you would die from a heart attack if you weren't mm -hmm. careful. But, you know, you know, DMT, you know, seems, you know, medically, mm -hmm. you know, relatively non-toxic. 
But at the same time, uh, I get emails a few times a year from parents or relatives of you know people that have just smoked too much DMT, mm-hmm. and they've you know developed a, especially you know you know difficult to treat psychosis. Mm-hmm. You know they're in jail. You know they're wow. in the hospital. Wow. They've got a bad case of the dwindles. They just have not you know really pulled themselves out of the you know DMT wow. you know wormhole as it were. Wow. You know so you can have you know problems with mm-hmm. you know DMT. Uh, you know psychological problems, spiritual problems. You know one thing which I've encountered you know surprisingly frequently is young you know people that have smoked a lot of DMT mm-hmm. and um, they're convinced that they've got the answer, like you know the answer. Yeah. And uh, it isn't especially, you know, profound what they've come up with, but if you if you point that out to them, or you kind of you know ask them to lighten up, or you know include other people in their party, or mm-hmm. you know think about it, you know from other people's point of view, they get extremely defensive. Mm-hmm. Like you should know better, or I've got the you know secret to the universe, and I just have to tell you. You know, so I think it's those kind of people who continue smoking DMT mm-hmm. and, you know, they become quite wrapped up in their own, you know, mindset and worldview that uh, start to have some, you know, problems when they're challenged by the outside world. And, you know, those are the ones who might end up getting psychotic or ending up in jail. Dr. Strassman, this it's a bit kind of my personal thoughts. I, I just kind of wanted to bounce it off of you before uh, we let you go. But, you know, just kind of talking to people the last few years, it seems that we're living in a time that, that it kind of echoes the, the 60s in a, in a strange way and, and not in the positive ways. The war in Iraq, it was just as unpopular as, as Vietnam was in, in those days. We've seen lately the unfortunate cases of police brutality and, and racism on literally like a, a daily basis, uh, which is very similar to the civil rights struggles that was going on in the 60s. And equally, it seems that just as psychedelics were popular during that time, they seem to be making this comeback, if you will. Do you think that our social context has something to do with the interest in DMT and psychedelics and such? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is... Uh, really striking how you know similar these last few years have been with respect to the 60s. Yeah, uh, you know the racism, uh, the interest in psychedelics again. You know, kind of a pacifist mentality. You know, you've heard the expression three steps forward, two steps back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, things go in waves. Uh, but still, you know, th- well, I suppose you know, th- it isn't that they go in you know waves or even you know cycles, but they go in a spiral. You know, they go around and around, but they also, you know, go directionally forward. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that we've learned more or we've learned, you know, something which will make us returning to a, you know, similar point of ignorance easier to break through this time. And, you know, then we'll forget about it for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, the Dark Ages will kind of want to impose their ignorance. But uh, Mm -hmm. I think. You know, there is an advance in consciousness that's gradually happening. You know, I'm even more interesting, you know, than the recurrence of, you know, psychedelic, you know, research and, you know, racism kinds of questions and, you know, pacifism mm-hmm. is this whole issue of, of, you know, religious, you know, fundamentalism, um, which, uh, right. I, I think is an important one to place into context. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, you know, not, uh, you know, naive enough to believe that, you know, drugs um, are the answer to anything, mm-hmm. um, especially because, you know, psychedelics, you know, have been used, you know, for nefarious purposes. You know, the Nazis were into mescaline for their occult studies right. and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, neo-Nazis, you know, like to trip as well. And it, it will strengthen and, you know, reinforce their, uh, you know, nationalistic, mm-hmm. ethnic, you know, superiority ideas. You know, so there isn't anything, you know, magical um, about, you know, the drugs themselves. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there ought to be, you know, some way, it seems like, to combat religious fundamentalism with the, you know, psychedelic state mm-hmm. if it's channeled in the right way. You know, I might you know, think about the psychedelics as tools. Right. You know, they can be like a hammer. They can break things or they can, you know, drive a nail and build things. You know, so I think there ought to be, you know, some attention looked at anyway. I'm not even sure how to articulate the question, but to uh, 
apply you know the beneficial potential of the psychedelic state towards combating you know religious and fundamentalism. Wow, that is very true, Dr. Strassman. Your website is Rick Strassman. S T R A S S M A N Strassman dot com. People can go there and order your books. You will sign and inscribe them. And your books are now available not just in physical form, but they can get, a, I believe, it, there's an audio book, a Kindle version, and all that good stuff, correct? Right. Yeah, th yeah there's a Kindle version for all three. You know, th uh, the first one and my newest one and, you know, the co-authored one in the middle. And, uh, you know, there's an audio book, you know, for the first one and the third one. Very cool. And of course, there's the uh, documentary, if people haven't seen it, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Can uh, I end on one question? Yep. I guess it's more of a personal question, but it's related to um, what you spoke about in Chapter 13, I believe, of The Spirit Molecule. And, you know, one of the questions asked is, what would happen to the study of spirit realms if we could access them reliably using molecules like DMT? So do you personally believe that the world would be a better place if let's say we knew how to use DMT and everyone had access to it. Um, do you think everyone sh should do it then and that the world will be a better place or that it, it's not something that everyone should tap into? Well, no, I mean, when you know people ask me about, you know, how to use DMT, should I take it with my antidepressant? I've got cancer, should I take ayahuasca? I mean, I discourage everybody who emails me from taking drugs. Um, and then when push comes to shove, I say people usually don't take my advice. You know, so, you know, that being the case, you should be as, you know, well prepared and, you know, healthy as you can and, you know, read up on it and study it and consumer beware. You know, I just don't think everybody should trip. I think mm -hmm. if there's three parts to a you know, drug experience, the drug and the set and the setting, mm -hmm. the most dispensable of the three is probably drug. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you are around good people and you're trying to improve yourself, mm -hmm. I think the chances of the world being a better place would probably be, you know, just as great as if it were the case that more people were taking psychedelics. But, you know, that being said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are still going to take psychedelics uh, right. in, um, in order to improve themselves, improve the world, mm -hmm. or to uh, make themselves, you know, weirder or make the world weirder. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been around plenty of people who have, you know, taken psychedelics and been just complete jerks. And and oh, they, wow. you know, justify it by being high. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they're tools. You know, they can yeah. be helpful or they can be destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the, the question about the reality of the spiritual you know, realms is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's increasing interest in, in working on determining the objective nature yeah. of the beings. Yeah. But I think we have to be super careful about that because, you know, what for? You know, like... You know, one of the you know definitions of the occult is to use spiritual you know forces you know mm -hmm. you know to use yeah. them as yeah. opposed to being instructed mm -hmm. by them. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so I think we have to be careful what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. the, as crazy or as paranoid as it may sound. Uh, I mean, what if we do establish a reliable conduit of communication with the beings? You know, yeah. you know, you know, who is in charge here? And you know, do they want to weaponize us, or are we yeah. going to try to weaponize them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it may open up a real can of worms. So I, I think any approach to looking at the reality basis of the beings has to be tempered with an ethical and a you know religious you know, sensibility, you know, foundation, uh, not purely a scientific or commercial or you know military one. Dr. Strassman, thank you so much for being so more than generous with your time. We really appreciate it. Again, we, we uh, encourage people to check out the website, rickstrassman.com. Check out the books if you haven't. Check out the documentary if you haven't, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And also check out his other books, DMT and The Soul of Prophecy. And you co-wrote Inner Paths to Outer Space, correct? Right, right, okay. yes. So... Uh, Professor Mann has wanted me to relay this message. Uh, please give him a personal thank you from me for all he has done to help the research and make it known to everyone and for this awesome interview. And it uh, echoes our sentiment. Dr. Strassman, thank you so much. Hopefully we can have you back on the show in, in the future because uh, obviously this topic is very layered and uh, you can uh, you know, go on for hours uh, talking about all, all these fascinating things. But I want to thank you sincerely for your time, and we hope to have you again in the future. Thank you so much. And I'd love to end okay. on this okay. quote, one yeah. of my favorite quotes, which is, it's better to ask some of the questions than know all the answers by James Thurber. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> very nice. Very nice. Thank you right, so that, much, Dr. Good quote, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so thanks. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed talking to both of you, Frank and Genevieve. Thank you so much, Dr. Shazman. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Okay, take care. Good night. Mm-hmm. Bye. Wow, that was intense. We literally just went over time. I don't know if and people we didn't take caught a break. that. And we didn't take a break because it was that that kind of an interview. And we kind of started on time. I mean, what's happening? Yeah, it, <laughs> you know, Dr. Rick Strassman, I mean, it was uh, definitely everything I, I, I had hoped in an interview. It was insightful. Uh, it was candid. It was honest. And... Uh, I like that he maintained his neutrality in the topic because it, it, it's something that I oh, think no, gets lost in the he zeal of, at of uh, a topic of this nature. Yeah, no, no, he was, you couldn't pick holes in his answers and comments and arguments. It, it was very straight to the point. Yeah, no, no it was, around the bush, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, I, um, this, again, the, the type of interview that I go back and listen to again because there's so much in there, uh, to, to chew on and, and savor and, and all that good stuff. So check out the books. Like I said, check out the documentary if you haven't. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic. And, and honestly, it was a, a, a privilege for me to, to have, uh, uh, Dr. Strassman here tonight and talk about these things. It was really no, it was heavy great. stuff. I mean, you know, I love biology and psychiatry and anything sciencey. So I was happy yeah. to to ask some questions. Oh, definitely. Uh, that being said, thank you guys for uh, tuning in tonight. Take care. Be safe. God bless. Don't do anything too crazy. We want to see you back next week. As always, I'm Engineer Frank on Twitter. West of the Rockies on Facebook. Genevieve Ua on Twitter. Yep. You can catch her every Thursday night right here, same channel, same station, uh, doing her show. At no added no flavors. Added flavors. Yep. Twitter at no added flavors O U R S at the end. Also yeah. Facebook no added flavors. So uh, uh, so so go promote us, go follow us, go share everything. Yeah, honestly, that's what we rely on. Yeah, support, support, support. We're gonna go out with a track that um, I was gonna take a break, but obviously the conversation was just kept moving, and you know I couldn't I couldn't no put the brakes on that. Cap. Nope. Uh, so I'm gonna play the song that I wanted to play during the break, which is I think quite fitting considering the topic and this one comes by way of rodriguez also from our friends at light in the attic records mm-hmm. uh and this track honestly i love this track it's called crucifying your mind and it's uh it's genius if i may say so myself so enjoy this one until next week guys take care we'll see you bye-bye Au revoir. <laughs> west of the rockies with frank the engineer on the independent fm los angeles